Hello, I'm Marsha Ramroop, the Director of Inclusion at the RIBA, and I'd like to welcome you and thank you uh, for joining us uh, for the fourth event in our talks uh, series, Architecture and You, the RIBA's first public talk series focusing entirely on sustainability. The series aims to expand contemporary debate on the topic and look more holistically at sustainability to embrace social, economic and environmental concerns. And I'm especially pleased to have been asked to introduce this because I do say that sustainability and inclusion are two sides of the same coin, how we value our planet and how we value each other. Architecture Anew is part of our ongoing partnership with Vitra Bathrooms, and I'd like to thank Vitra Bathrooms for sponsoring this important series. We are very pleased that today's event is also part of the London Festival of Architecture programme, whose theme this year is care. Though the whole series ties in very well with this theme, today's talk is particularly aligned uh, through its focus on architects, researchers and designers using their skills for humanitarian and social justice projects. The title of tonight's event is Architects Beyond Architecture, which references the recent publication Architects After Architecture, co-edited by Harriet Harris, Rory Hyde and Roberta Marcaccio. Both the book and tonight's event feature change makers who have used their architectural training in new and resourceful ways to expand the traditional limits of the discipline. We're delighted to have both Harriet and Roberta with us tonight who will act as chairs for the rest of the event. Harriet Harris is an architect and Dean of the Pratt School of Architecture in New York. And Roberta Marcaccio is an editor and an educator at the Architectural Association in London. Without any further delay, I'm now very pleased to hand you over to Roberta. Hello, um, I will step in while Roberta battles um, the joys of technology um, and actually cover some of the content that she was going to kick off with today. And again, thank you all for joining us. Um, and of course, we have written this book and the book is, I think, a very small window into a much larger um, range of activities, projects, initiatives, um, organisations doing work that we think very much is remains and should be considered within architecture's remit. Um, so I would, before I, we head on to introduce the speakers for this afternoon, um, want to just say a little bit more about the context um, that we're obviously here to talk about this evening. Um, and it's really, as, as has just been mentioned, an emphasis on understanding the, if you like, um, the ways in which uh, climate crisis and actually social justice are broadly, um, broadly intersect in a very profound way. So one could obviously dilute that down into making a more general statement about um, the role architects can play in a sustainable future. Um, but as you'll see from the many speakers, all the speakers this afternoon, um, there is a really strong social heart to many of the ecological and environmental propositions that have driven um, the initiatives and organizations and businesses. So when we kick-started our project, um, Architects After Architecture, Alternative Pathways for Practice, um, which we edited alongside our dearly departed to Australia colleague, uh, Rory Hyde, who was formerly, as you know, Curator of Architecture at the VNA, and is now Associate Professor at, uh, in, of Architecture at the University of Melbourne. Um, we were very interested in trying to make a case against, in a way, protectionism that has dominated, I think, much of the mainstream thinking in the architecture profession that we are here to, you know, wave our, our cutlasses in the direction of marauding project managers and other disciplines who keep trying to slice off bits of what we do and by implication devalue um, our fees and our services and of course our costs. Um, and I think for us, it was far more interesting to consider the fact that so many architecture students, in fact, the majority of them leave higher education um, and then go off to become not architects. So in a way we have far greater impact on other sectors and other disciplines than we do our own. Um, through the pathways of our graduates. 
So I think that was the provocation for us that we wanted to respond to. And of course, the statistics are always contested are indeed regional, which is why we're doing a big study in Europe about this right now, multi-consortium analysis of architectural futures. But coming back to this, what we often find is students come through um, their education experience being given the very strong impression that unless they want to become architects and you know one should parenthesis this with you know be on unpaid internships or badly paid or spend years paying off debt because the salaries relative to other construction professionals are really low um forward slash all the sexism racism and other forms of um i would say uh, hierarchical oppression within uh, many architecture practices all of those things to look forward to it's a little wonder then that many of them think of alternatives um, and also, I think there's, in some cases, looking at the models of, of traditional architecture, um, there is not necessarily um, embedded in many of uh, many architects' agendas a really strong social or ecological beating heart. Um, so in, in, in some cases, and certainly in the examples we're here today, there's this pull toward going off and pioneering using that three-dimensional design thinking to design and effectively implement the infrastructure of more inclusive and more socially and ecologically responsive practice models. So this was our conceit within the book. Um, we decided that this would, I think, provide the beginning of a palimpsest and a roadmap um, looking to um, some of these initiatives and organisations, but also providing um, unwittingly at the time we didn't know this, but providing to students who faced even more disruption um, graduating from architecture schools because of the pandemic and indeed many practitioners have been affected, some sense of what these alternative um, realities could be um, and actually just how powerful um, and I think people centric many of them are too. So this shift, of course, is about understanding the broader um, applicability of an architectural qualification. In my view, it's what evidence is its true value. If the only metric at the moment we use to judge architecture as an architecture qualification is um, whether or not um, it creates architects, I think that's very short sighted. And that was our conceit. And it's what we tried to challenge. So the book really seeks to answer a simple question. What can you do with this degree? We presented 40 answers within the book, um, various, if you like, formats, text interviews with practitioners and, and kind of opinion pieces. Um, and of course, we group these answers into sections plus and beyond at the center of the diagram. You can see architecture and that's a traditional practice, um, which is getting crowded out these days. I think there's a slide relevant to this. And also, um, Roberta, do you want to jump in at this point if you're now recovered from your technological trauma and riff on from here? Perfect. Yes, I can do that. Um, not sure what happened. Um, if you can bring the next slide, then I'll discuss, I'll introduce the structure of the book. So as Ariad was saying, the book answers the question, what you, can you do with a degree in architecture? And the answers that we present are largely grouped into two sections, what we called plus and beyond. So at the center that you see on the screen, um, there is what we might call architecture, which is the idea of a standard way of practicing, usually in an urban center and for the people who can afford the projects, um, which is traditional practice and is getting crowded by new ways of working. So to the left, you have plus, which are the people who maybe still describe themselves as architects, but who have basically reinvented what they do and who they work for. Um, and also like reconceptualizing um, ideas around sustainability and around well-being or uh, etc. And on the right, on the other side, you have the so-called beyond, which are the people who have trained in architecture, but who are applying their architectural skills and intelligence to other fields. This could be technology, this could be politics, but crucially for our discussions tonight, this evening, are people whose work um, has taken space, has taken the space of the humanitarian sector and the public good at large. So through this book, by drawing the boundaries of the profession to include all these different experiences, which are not often talked about, we wanted to shift the emphasis away from building, which is the, those form making exercises for which architects have become famous, towards instead a way of thinking a flexibility of mind and the capacity to bridge between different forms of knowledge and disparate communities, which we believe are those qualities that are really needed to design a more sustainable future. So our speakers today, our brilliant speakers, definitely possess these qualities and indeed um, so um, some of them were like also included in our book. 
And so we're going to hear first from Chris, who was one of our contributors to the book. So Chris is an award-winning architect who developed a social enterprise proxy address to tackle systemic issues faced by those experiencing homelessness. And he believes that good design should be socially, economically, and ecologically sustainable. Chris has been named a big issue change maker and an RBA rising star and a designer in residence of the Design Museum. And in 2018, he was awarded the RBA President's Medal for Research. Over to you, Chris. Thank you, Roberto. Um, so yes, as Roberta says, uh, I'm going to speak to you today a little about proxy address, and particularly uh, why I decided to to create proxy address, especially given my architectural background. Um, but before I describe the why, I thought it'd be useful to explain some of the what. Um, so there's a short 90 second video uh, just coming up, which will give you a kind of overview of what proxy address is and what it's trying to do. Uh, so if we can start that, that would be great. Homelessness can affect anyone and comes in many forms. Most people can recover with the right support at an early stage. But losing your home also means losing your address. And today, an address forms a key part of your identity. So, without one, you lose access to the services and support you need to get back on your feet. Proxy Address fixes this Catch-22 by using spare addresses and duplicating their data to create a proxy. This provides a stable identity for those without a permanent home. A proxy address is secure, private, and it moves with you wherever you go, all without affecting the original property, its post or credit rating. And because we use existing information, it saves councils money, making sure that every proxy address is free to the person using it. A proxy address helps those facing homelessness avoid a cliff edge, bridging a period of instability to help keep the path to recovery open for all. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I thought I would uh, just follow up now with some slides, which we can uh, move to. Um, so as the video explained there, what Proxy Address does is it gives stable address details to people who are going through homelessness. And that helps to break down the catch-22 that you find yourself in, um, whereby just because you lose your home, you also lose your address and with it, access to all the services that you really need at that time. But Proxy Address started actually a few years ago. Um, at the time, I was employed as an architect. I hadn't set up on my own yet. And I was uh, working as the project architect of the Natural History Museum grounds and main entrance project. And that was a long project. It took several years to get to that stage. And at the time, in 2017, it was on site. And so I was working on it about four days a week. And with the other three days a week, uh, I had been made what's called a designer in residence at the Design Museum. So, bear with me, my slides seem to be freezing a little. Um, there we go. Uh, design in residence at the Design Museum. And what that is, is each year the Design Museum selects four emerging designers from across the country uh, of different disciplines. And you're basically given um, eight months to uh, work and research on a brief and four months to exhibit that work. Now, in terms of the brief, each year there is a one word brief. And the one word that year was support. And I really wanted to use that as an opportunity to, to try and use my skills as an architect that I had learned throughout my education and practice to try and help people who live in and around the built environment. And for me, I think it was a really interesting time in my career because my career had to date really had the backdrop of austerity throughout it. And that is to say, I was working as an architect, and yet I was watching as libraries were closed, uh, parks were shut down, um, public land was sold off, public toilets were demolished, and homelessness was increasing. Now, all these things are critical elements of how people experience the built environment, and yet it wasn't my remit as an architect to really do anything about it. Now, 
for me, I think a perfect example of, of the sort of limited agency that I was finding frustrating is, is this building, which is the Birmingham Library by Meccanu, which by all rights is an incredibly successful <clears throat> and well-designed building. It cost about 189 million, and it was completed in around 2013. And Meccanu did a fantastic job, and it really did just about everything that a library should do. But the problem was within a year of it opening, local authority cuts meant that the opening hours were halved and the number of staff was halved. And so despite designing a fantastic library, for reasons beyond the architect's control, they only ended up with half a library, essentially. So I really wanted to see how could I use my skills in a way that wasn't a, a building, in a way that wasn't so dependent on external circumstances, that I could go in and more directly help people. And so for that, I wanted to focus on homelessness, which is, to my mind, the most urgent need within the built environment. And I went into it fully aware of my own naivety. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have never been homeless myself. And one of the first pieces of advice I got from a frontline charity worker was just don't design a better tent, because that seemed to be the sort of reaction that most people had when they thought of architects dabbling in homelessness. So I went up and down the country for most of the eight months and I spoke to people. Uh, I spoke to hundreds of people who were homeless, who were, used to be homeless, frontline charity workers, policy makers, MPs, uh, people in financial regulation, anybody who would speak to me basically. And the things I learned, even though I had done my ground basis of research, still shocked me. I mean, at the time there was about estimated about 320,000 people in the UK facing some form of homelessness. That's one in 200 people. But what's really surprising when you look at it is that most people think of homelessness as being rough sleeping. Uh, but actually, there's a huge amount of people who are in sofa surfing. And all three of these, these situations are, are underpinned by the same problem, which is this instability, this, this in, incapability to really plant roots and have a stake within the built environment. Now, for those who do end up rough sleeping, the, the impact is really, really harsh. The, the average age of death of a rough sleeper in the UK is just 44 years old. Uh, that's lower than the lo world's lowest national life expectancy in the CAR. Now, I also worked with some experts in homelessness who looked at the sort of trends, if you like, of homelessness, the behavioral expectations within homelessness. And there's this vast split between the, the sort of the general assumptions and the realities of homelessness. And the general assumptions are this kind of dotted line here, which is that most people have most of the problem, that it's a kind of bell curve distribution issue. And that within that area, basically people are unable to keep their lives together. They may have substance abuse issues or mental health issues, but that's far from the case. In fact, at the time, and this continues as a trend today, the number one reason for homelessness in the UK was the end of a private tenancy. And so actually most people who who find themselves entering into homelessness do so perfectly capable of recovery. My question was, well, why aren't people recovering then? Why is it that they're being left to become entrenched in homelessness and develop mental health and substance abuse issues? And this is ultimately what I found. And it's, it's the role of an address within what you might consider to be the, the fundamental foundation for an independent and healthy life. Everything that you would need to go about getting work, saving, getting a place to live, even voting, all of these things require an address. And I mean, if you take, for instance, the electoral register, you don't need an address for the electoral register. But the things you do need, they need an address. So lots and lots of knock on effects. Now, at the time, uh, there was this piece of legislation that came in called the Homelessness Reduction Act. And this put a lot of new duties onto local councils to prevent and relieve homelessness. But as with architecture, um, what you find as you experience um, difficulties with planning departments, you find in housing departments as well, which is that there just isn't very much money around. It, everybody is stretched for resource. And so the funding model for the whole local authorities across the country was shifting from this model in 2010 to one in 2020, where ultimately you saw about 20% on average cut in funding, with which they're now being asked to do a lot more. So my question, looking at this from an architectural point of view was, why can't we bring these problems together? Why can't we allow somebody who doesn't have an address to be basically borrow one and therefore access the services that they need? And this introduced a really interesting question at the time, which is what really is an address? Because if you think about it, an address is really the most public information we have in the country. Uh, you can walk down any street and look at the street name and look at the door, the, the door number and you have the location and the address of that building. 
But if you like, it, it, for me, I think part of the problem here is the fact that most people don't see the city like architects would see the city. Most people see the city as a very static thing, something that is made of stone and steel and doesn't change quickly. But as architects, we know that the city is something that is constantly in flux and the systems that underpin it can be changed and are changed. And so for me, I think the, the important thing about this was to, to start to question how addresses are used and start to implement it in a way that could be very useful for other people. And that's really the basis of proxy address. It's this idea that you have fixed address data, you give it to people who are changing, and that is the proxy address. Now, generally speaking, it works in three different ways. I don't have the time really to go into how each of these things work. But in terms of the postal service, um, it can be illustrated by explaining the example of Father Christmas. So every year, 800,000 children in the UK send Father Christmas a piece of mail that is addressed to Father Christmas at Reindeer Land. And it doesn't go to Reindeer Land, it goes to a sorting office in Belfast. But if Father Christmas can get his mail redirected, why can't people who really need it? And that's the crux of what, how we use the, uh, the postal redirection. The really crucial one is financial services, where there's a lot of issues around protecting against fraud. And that's where we've started and where we currently are, which is in a live pilot in Lewisham in London, working with banks such as uh, Barclays and Monzo, and working with partners like Crisis and The Big Issue. And what we're doing is the most difficult thing that we can do in order to comply with the anti-fraud legislations, which is to open bank accounts using the proxy address. And that lays the groundwork for all these other services. And we're doing that in partnership with the regulator themselves, the Financial Conduct Authority. So at the moment, we've already helped lots of people and we've seen such amazing results from it. We've seen people go from rough sleeping for three years to finding a place of their own in as little as 18 days. We've opened bank accounts for some people who have never had one uh, the same day that they've turned up, in some cases, as little as three hours. And basically what we're trying to do is to use this, this architectural approach in a way that doesn't result in buildings. Because what architecture has taught me, certainly, is how to navigate and negotiate through constraints. And now more than ever, there are so many constraints to be navigated. And for me, I think that's a really good reason that architects shouldn't look to constraining themselves purely to buildings. And that's my last slide, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, brilliant presentation and lots of food for thought particularly about the frustration with the architectural profession and what architects can really do. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who's Lindsay Bremner. She's a research architect whose current work focuses on human more than human entanglements in oceanic worlds. And she currently holds a European Research Council grant for her project Monsoon Assemblage, which she will be discussing this evening. She's also a professor of architecture at the University of Westminster in London, when she directs the research in the School of Architecture and Cities. Over to you, Lindsay. Great. Can you see my first slide there? Is it working? I hope so. Um, thank you very much. Um, this evening I'm going to introduce Monsoon Assemblages, which is a European Council research funded project that I and a small team of researchers at the University of Westminster have worked on for the past five years. Our work has inquired into the question of how to reorientate spatial practice around the monsoon in order to promote social solidarity for tackling climate change and ecological crisis. Through this work, we developed the idea of architecture as a mode of climate practice, prioritizing ecological, political, and ethical engagements with communities and places. While commonly associated with India, the monsoon is a tropical weather system that encircles the planet, moving with the shifting latitude of the thermal equator as the Earth orbits around the sun. This map by one of my researchers, John Cook, shows the monsoonal regions around the world and the shifting of this thermal equator. It is driven by the differential heating and cooling of land and sea, 
and the Earth's Coriolis force, which cause winds to reverse direction twice a year and to deliver markedly seasonal rainfall. These two maps illustrate this in relation to the South Indian monsoon. But this physical definition of the monsoon belies its complexity as what Tim Ingold calls a weather world within which life and death unfold. Monsoon assemblages took the monsoons as seriously as an object of study and as a method of research. It was premised on the idea that we do not live so much on the earth as in the weather. For far too long, spatial practice has been abstract, Euclidean and orthographic. If it is to rise to the challenge of the climate and ecological crisis we face, it needs to acknowledge climate and weather as spatial temporal agents in their own rights and evolve methods for thinking with rather than against them. This is a beautiful map of the South Asian monsoon across the year, um, drawn by, once again, by John Cook. In many parts of the world today, explosive economic growth and rapid urbanization have turned the monsoon into a problem to be solved. This is an image of the Chennai floods of 2015 resulting in measures like climate proofing, which are quite frankly absurd. In contrast with this, our work proposed rethinking the monsoon as an active protagonist of design and of design as interactive weather work. This is a, an extraordinary image of the traditional way of dealing with flooding in Chennai. The arrows represent water flowing across topography and the red lines represent small dams that people constructed to stop and hold these flows, allowing water to seep into the ground and replenish the aquifer. For our work, this required thinking across disciplines, elements, species, scales, and times, from dragonflies to fish, to brick fields, to extinct volcanoes. For climate and weather are intersectional spatial temporal practices that cut across divisions between land, sea, and air. This is an image, this is a section through Dhaka showing the Himalayas geology and the atmosphere. The weather cuts across science and politics, across humans and non-humans, across policy and affect. Learning to think like a climate and with the weather required drawing from many disciplines and practices, from science, critical theory, race theory, anthropology, from conversations, from observations, from embodied experiences, from multi-species encounters, from math and music, and drawing these diverse forms of knowledge into conversations with one another in order to understand complex situations and to evolve new hybrid methodologies for engaging with them. But I realize that all this has been rather abstract so far, so I will end my talk by turning briefly to how we did this. We use two primary methods in our research, cartography or mapping and ethnography. This is another one of these calendars of the monsoon, this time across North India, showing the monthly rainfall across the region just south of the Himalayas and where Dhaka is located. So on the one hand, we ma mapped the monsoon as a meteorological, hydrological, geological system using online data of various sorts and tools used by architecture, rhino, grasshopper, and to a lesser extent, GIS and real flow. We then mapped the, the sites of our research, in this case, Dhaka, into the monsoon as part of monsoonal systems. 
These are two maps of Dhaka, the one on the left showing the Madhupur track, which is an elevated plateau on which the city was founded, raising it above the floodplains. The one on the right shows how, as the city grew, it spread eastward into the floodplains and grew on plateaus of sand pumped from sedimentary monsoonal rivers. In this way, by coupling ethnographic research interviews, conversations, field notes, photography, and video, with these larger cartographic representations, we arrived at understandings of what those larger monsoonal systems meant as lived experience to humans and non-humans alike. Cartography and ethnography then were the methods of our climate practice, enabling us to build up new intersectional understandings of the intimate entanglements between meteorology and societal processes with their political and ethical consequences. This is a map of the garment industry in Dhaka and the pollution of the rivers uh, represented cartographically and then in video form by the runoff of, of dying processes. I'm going to conclude by referring you to our exhibition, our, our online exhibition, Monsoonal Multiplicities, that, that's the address, where the outcomes of our research are more fully exhibited. Thanks very much. That's the end, um, my last slide. Introduce Mark E. Breeze. Um, so Mark E. Breeze is an architect and an Emmy-nominated documentary filmmaker who combines interdisciplinary practice, research, and teaching with environmental design advocacy. Um, he also works at the intersection of architecture and film, and his current work explores the theories, practices, and forms of sustainable shelter. So he's here to talk a bit about the documentary film Shelter Without Shelter. So over to you, Mark, and welcome. Thank you very much, Harriet. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this um, event as well. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, tonight, I'm gonna to talk briefly about my recent documentary, uh, Shelter Without Shelter. Um, I guess, is my slide ready? Is that showing up? Uh, having problems with the slide showing up. I'll try resharing. Sorry about this. Can you see that now? Yes? Not yet, I'm afraid, Mark. Uh, okay. Let's try that one more time. Sure. How about now? Is that good? Great. That's it, brilliant. Uh, sorry about that, technical delights after a year spent on Zoom, uh, still mastering technical complexities. Well, thank you very much for having me here. Um, uh, I thought I'd start just by um, introducing myself a bit to know, so you can understand where I'm coming from. I'm an architect and a filmmaker working across both domains through my collaborative practice, spatial realities. Um, and apart from collaborating on pure architecture projects, I also make long form and short form documentaries exploring the stories, impacts and possibilities of architecture. From the Emmy award winning six hour documentary series on the rebuilding of Ground Zero uh, to short form private commissions on architecture projects and topics. I also research and write as part of my practice. I have a long standing interest in the relationships between film and architecture. And you can buy the uh, incredibly expensive uh, copy of the uh, recent book I edited at uh, your favorite niche bookstore. Uh, I also engage in architectural research on shelter through the Sustainable Shelter Group, which I chair at the University of Cambridge. This group seeks to bring together academic research, professional design practice, and humanitarian practitioners to help create integrated, sustainable, and relevant sheltering solutions at any scale and in any geography. I advocate for more sustainable architectural practice in my role as the founding UK Sustainability Chair at the American Institute of Architects, 
And finally, I'm currently teaching a studio at the Architectural Association, exploring notions of shelter and domesticity, uh, Experimental 17. Um, the Shelter Without Shelter film grows out of the Architectures of Displacement Research Project at the University of Oxford, which I collaborated on with uh, my colleague, uh, Professor of Forced Migration, Tom Scott Smith. Um, apart from the film, we also edited a book on the topic, which is also available at your favorite niche bookstore for a small fortune. And uh, colleagues at the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford staged an exhibition focused on the Calais jungle, which was part of our research. We contributed to the recent Imperial War Museum exhibition, Refugees Forced to Flee, um, which I believe just unfortunately closed, um, and created the, the world's first uh, online crowdsourced refugee shelter inventory, um, which we're working with the International Organization of Migration to uh, give an, a new life to. Um, the six-part documentary was both a method of research and a product of it, examining the hopes, challenges, and complex dilemmas involved in attempts to house refugees in emergency conditions across Europe and the Middle East since 2015, essentially the so-called sort of summer of migration um, from, uh, triggered by uh, events in Syria. We started with two key questions. Uh, firstly, what, if any, is the role of architectural design in this process, and what could it be? And secondly, we all need shelter, but what is it? We drew on not only the first-hand lived experiences of migrants and refugees on the ground, and from those struggling to find shelter, to those sheltering themselves informally, and those temporarily sheltered by humanitarian organizations. A key part of the story for us was also understanding the commonly overlooked perspectives of those providing the sheltering solutions from the humanitarians on the ground to the multi-billion dollar global emergency shelter industry behind it. And finally, and very importantly, we spoke to a wide, wide range of critics of the existing systems too. We started by examining existing formal humanitarian shelter solutions that treat shelter as an engineered universal product from recent flat pack solutions, such as the IKEA Foundation supported better shelter housing unit, refugee housing unit, to the classic UNHCR family tent and the steel transitional shelter or tea shelter um, used in mega camps such as Azraq in Northern Jordan. This is engineered universal product design on a massive scale. We were especially interested in the refugees and formal modification and reconfiguration of these institutional solutions, creating not only more personal and distinct living spaces for their own needs, but also reconfiguring the actual arrangement of the units to create shared areas that echoed traditional dwellings, such as in internal courtyards, the creation of internal courtyards, or external gardens and more private outdoor areas, for example. Indiv individual units were also modified to create new functions, such as live work units or shop spaces, for example, which famously in Zatri camp in Jordan, were then reconfigured on a huge scale to create what was became known as the Champs-Elysees, a thriving street of uh, shops where you could buy everything from wedding dresses and bread to bicycles and flat screen TVs. Third key type of shelter were fully informal self-built shelters and settlements where migrants used basic materials such as wood and tarpaulin either bought, salvaged, or given by NGOs to create their own shelters, both outside, such as these in the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon, and inside through repurposing existing structures, such as this former shopping mall in Northern Lebanon, and also occupying half-built or deserted structures to squatting major former infrastructure buildings, such as at Alenico Airport in Athens, and existing buildings in the city, such as the Hotel City Plaza in Athens, for example. Here, all aspects of the former hotel were taken over to create a functioning informal settlement in the city, from the lively social bar, volunteer run, all self-run, to the fully functioning self-run kitchens, providing meals for all the residents every night. A fourth key type of migrant shelter was the governmental requisition of buildings for shelter, 
such as here at Berlin Tempelhof Airport, where shelter involved bunk beds in wooden, roofless, and doorless cubicles in hangars, a chronically inadequate sol shelter solution for anything more than the very short term. Or similarly, at the former International Convention Center in Berlin, originally closed down due to as asbestos, but reopened to house refugees. Shelter is in many ways treated as an engineered universal product to fit within any containing structure. Yeah. Throughout the process, we sought out shelter solutions that involved professional designers wherever we could find them. Although few and far between, one of the best examples is the Social Furniture Project, a collaboration between the charity Caritas in Vienna and the furniture designers EOS. It showed the power of even small scale design to transform the quality and nature of shelter spaces, whilst also helping build skills and community. EOS created a catalog of basic furniture items and using donated wood from a concrete boarding company, along with financial support from Caritas, they created social furniture workshops, fully fitted out with uh, woodworking equipment and uh, shelters around uh, in various locations in which to actually conduct these workshops. Refugees could come together to make specific furniture items for themselves and each other. Not only did this enable them to personalize their shelter spaces and make them work better for them, but it also helped them build new skills and social communities in the process. Something that's particularly relevant given that when you are seeking asylum, you've made your asylum claim, you're unable to legally work. So the, the, the opportunity and chance to actually engage in some activity, um, meet new people is, is not to be underestimated. Architects need to be more collaboratively involved in the shelter and settlements process, given their uniquely integrated design training involving strategic compromise and their professional expertise in creating effective human sheltering solutions that engage with both the pragmatic and less tangible elements of the sheltering process. Human shelter is not an engineered spread, spreadsheet solution, however temporary it might be intended to be. Human shelter is the most essential form of architecture. At present, most humanitarian architecture is beyond architects. The film of premiere is the closing film at the London Architecture Film Festival on Sunday, the 27th of June. Uh, please do sign up if you want to watch it. Uh, we'll now um, show you the tech trailer for the film. Thank you very much. ما هو وقت نحل المشكلة السورية حتى واحد يرجع؟ إذا تضل هيك يعني مش الحل يا رب ما حد إني واحد إني ركزوا هالعالم ترجع حيطوا على بلادها تاني شيء I don't like the word shelter. Because I wouldn't say I live in a shelter. I think just shelter divides us. to save these people's lives or not. Is it more important to you how people feel or that they are alive?
Fantastic. Thank you so very much for that, uh, Mark. That was incredible. So um, I'm going to now jump to our next speaker, which is uh, Kishan San. Um, Kishan San is an architectural researcher, designer and educator currently working as a researcher at FA. FA is a research agency based at Goldsmiths, University of London. It investigates rights violations, including um, violence committed by states, police force, forces, militaries and corporations. I'm sorry, I should always just not use the acronym Forensic Architecture. Um, with, within Forensic Architecture, Kishan has researched and produced video reports on human rights, um, violations across the globe, including on police brutality in Chicago, violence at the Greek-Turkish border and the Beirut port explosion. So welcome, Kishan. We look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Harriet. Um, yeah, as Harriet mentioned, uh, I'm architecturally trained and currently a researcher and project coordinator of Forensic Architecture. Uh, forensic Architecture is an independent research agency based at Goldsmiths, the University of London, utilising spatial and media analysis to investigate state and corporate violence worldwide, from war crimes to violations of human or environmental rights. So now we're about a team of around 25 people, various backgrounds and disciplines, including architecture, filmmaking, journalism, art, programming, and many more. But to further explain what we do, I'm gonna take you through a couple of the key concepts our work is built upon. Um, and the first is obviously architecture. So the term forensic architecture has actually previously denoted something very different. It designates the work of building surveyors, the careful analysis of structures, establishing the cause of collapse or damage undergone. Um, and they also use animation and 3D models to illustrate not only the damage, but the dynamic use of buildings. So this is still from the uh, Grenfell Tower in Cryo in 2018. And this is useful for understanding architecture, not as a static motionless form, but as a dynamic and temporal one as buildings are always in often imperceivable transformation and motion, reacting and registering forces. And by examining the built environment, you can reconstruct the processes and narratives of this transformation. You can read events, forces and power structures through the matter of marks that are inscribed on the walls. And in that sense, architecture acts as a spatial record of the forces that act around and upon it. And during an incident, violent or otherwise, those forces make themselves apparent. Um, the second is a key technique we use to investigate the built environment, which is something we call an operative model. So we see digital and physical 3D models not as representations of future or fictional environments, as they're typically used in game design and architectural practice. Uh, but rather for us, they function as optical, analytical and operative devices, spatial models that help us synthesize data points and understand the way in which an incident may have unfolded. Such models, the purposes of investigation, are obviously seen in the world of architecture, but often apply to uh, floor area, the number of residential units that can be accommodated in a housing development, that kind of thing. So a large part of our design process is to develop and reform tools uh, utilised to serve the needs of capital towards a more humanitarian counter-forensic endeavour. Um, and to illustrate these points, I'm going to very, very briefly talk about projects we published with the Egyptian media outlet Madamasa on the Beirut port explosion. So it's, it's really important to view this investigation in the context of an ongoing body of research into the politics of clouds. Um, a cloud is obviously a visible mass of gaseous matter, often emitted or made visible uh, when a material has undergone a physical transformation. And the study of these forms uh, kind of requires a different approach because clouds are dynamic, their forms are elusive and difficult to, to, to determine. But successful representation of clouds is a problem that's occurred throughout history. Um, in traditional painting, where the clouds themselves are moving faster than the painter's brush could capture them. But today, um, with smartphones, we're able to capture clouds at 30 times a second. Social media platforms are able to distribute this imagery immediately. Uh, and with 2D and 3D editing software, we're able to parse and analyze the footage. So we can really unpick, unravel um, these forms. Um, so shortly after 6 p.m. on August the 4th, an explosion ripped through the port of Beirut, 
It killed more than 200 people, wounded over 6,500, and destroyed large parts of the city. The following week, Madame Massa contacted us to begin a collaborative investigation. Um, their investigative newsroom clicked into gear and started collating uh, available media online through open source investigative techniques and following leads through traditional journalistic uh, tools. And as with our previous cloud studies projects, we sought the consultation of experts. Uh, so this is a still from an interview. Um, and this, this was an interview with a UN explosives analyst uh, where they confirmed that the red cloud was likely the combustion of ammonium nitrate. But more importantly, he gave us two key entry points that would become the basis of the investigation. One, that the chemical composition of a material determines the color of cloud it produces when burning, i.e. each different colored plume indicates the combustion of a different material. And two, the spherical shape of the sphere indicates a single point explosion, i.e. the ammonium nitrate was stored at the center of this sphere. Um, so the plume itself acts as a 3D clock, which is in continuous transformation and motion with the unique but discernible shape at each frame. And by cross-referencing each source and using temporal markers such as the spherical explosion and initial flash of light from the blast, we can really sync up the footage. Um, this is simply done in the Adobe software After Effects, which of course works very well for syncing footage and analyzing media frame by frame. Um, this equally could be defined as, a uh, as an operative model, but in a more temporal sense. And then using an open source 3D model of Beirut City produced by a Lebanese architect many months before the incident and widely circulated after the incident, we're able to start geolocating each source. So this time we're able to use spatial markers distributed in the city to calibrate a given footages, camera or cone of vision. The 3D models allow us to synthesize these data points, aligning satellite imagery, videos, images, um, and other things into one environment, building a spatial account of the incident. So by chrono and geolocating imagery, we're really trying to unlock information beyond the boundary of the frame and in doing so demystify the event itself. So from here, we're able to identify four phases to the plume. The first plume emanates from the northeast corner of the warehouse. The second is from the same source point, has a darker color. The third appears on the northwest, and the final plume is developed from a spherical explosion located at the center of the warehouse. So each phase indicates a possible transformation, either in location, uh, chemical composition, or intensity. And at this point, we'd analyzed all the available evidence on an urban scale, the scale of the cloud against the city of Beirut. But this larger focus then provides clues to the smaller scale of the built environment and also the molecular measure of the chemical composition of the materials themselves. Um, so by analyzing between these scales simultaneously, we can build up a larger, more precise scientific, historical and political picture of the event. So as we move inside and using the bays, the roof beams and the windows, we could then precisely position each photograph of the interior, um, revealing its layout. The bay numbers visible in this from the ceiling confirmed our analysis there here, four and five there. And together, these videos and images allowed us to map a total of 243 bags of ammonium nitrate in space. But given the location of the source of the spherical plume here at Bay 8, the remaining 2,500 bags of ammonium nitrate should have been stored there. So news reports suggested that in addition to the ammonium nitrate, the warehouse also stores 23 tons of fireworks, 50 tons of ammonium phosphate, 5 tons of tea and coffee, 5 rolls of slow burning detonating cord and 1,000 car tires. Each of these materials burns differently. So the Combustion of tires, for example, produces a dark and thick plume. And according to the expert, it could correspond to the dark plume that we would located in the northeast of the warehouse. He also told us that the white plume that appeared in the northwest of the warehouse corresponds to the ignition of fireworks. So this layout of combustible and explosive material in proximity to haphazard, carelessly stored ammonium nitrate already highlights the state negligence which led to the disaster. Um, and from an engineering perspective, this is the spatial layout of a makeshift bomb. Um, so I'm just going to go through the next few slides really, really quickly. Um, I'm aware that I'm over time. Um, but I just want to get to this um, 
bit about regulations. So we kind of, we spatialize regulations all the time. So from like um, home housing design guys to fire safety regulations, it's part of a, a skill set that we as designers often undervalue. Um, but here we can apply our tools to the agency. So we look to internationally accepted benchmarks, in this case, Australian regulations. And it tells us that bags must be arranged in 500 ton stacks, but should be stored 890 meters away from the closest residential buildings. Um, and using their equation to calculate safe distances, we can determine that a 2,750 2, stack of ammonium nitrate should have been stored 1,570 meters away from the closest residential building. And what you can see here, the colored, the colored graph under, under the map is NASA's damage map. Um, so with this case, by defining the interior layout of the materials, we can reveal the danger uh, inherently built into the warehouse and therefore unravel the sustained state negligence that led to the disaster, hopefully shifting the burden of responsibility from the citizen, labour, civilian and back to the state through a form of bottom-up counter-forensic collective truth production. And this investigation was published by Madame Asso and Media Part, was widely circulated in the public sphere. Um, the investigation will provide a benchmark to review or judge the state's report upon publication. And when that happens, we'll be ready to review their findings and possibly reopen the case. Thank you. Right, I think at this stage we are now jumping into some Q&A, right, Roberta? Yes, before we do so, I would just like to say a few things about the platform that we are using so that the audience can participate, particularly after the Q&A. So for now, you should see a chat and a Q&A box on your screen, and we're happy for you to share comments in the chat during this, um, during this conversation that we're having. Uh, but for the Q&A at the end of the talk, that you can submit your own questions by that box, the Q&A box, so that you can get the chance to ask your question directly to the panel. So backstage, we have Chloe and Molly from the RBA Public Programme team, and they're going to select a number of those questions. Please remember to submit early so they can choose. And then you will receive a web link to join us backstage, and then you will get the chance to, you will have the instructions and you will get the chance to participate. So you should see a notification on the top right of your screen. And um, there are another couple of features which you might be able to use after the Q&A. They are the networking button and the info zone. So the networking button, again, is in the main navigation bar. And uh, if you press it, you will randomly paired with another member of the audience for the chat. And then you will have up to three minutes to uh, be in the chat with another person. And the info zone appears again at the end. So we have after the 30 minutes that we have for the networking and it gives you a chance to learn more about their new series and if you want to chat with the sponsors. So that's my housekeeping now. We can get into our conversation. And um, first of all, I'd like to thank the speakers because they have, I think they've, with the contributions, they've really expanded what we can, what we can think of as the work of, of of an architect and especially like the role that an architect can play within society and in addressing the major issues that we're facing as, um, um, uh, as a whole. And the first question that I'd like to ask is at what point of your training or maybe your practice have you realized that a conventional way of, of working in terms of making buildings or working within um, a private practice for private clients was just not going to cut it for you, was not your call. And um, I think, um, Chris, you started to say that at the beginning, so maybe we just pass the ball to someone else for, the, for now. But, you know, at what point did you feel a frustration maybe with the state of the profession or maybe with this 
the comic viability because that's another issue which is also quite heavy. Um, I don't know, maybe Mark, would you like to say something sure, here, given sure, that you're yeah. also I mean, I think... a practicing architect? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I've, I've had a long-standing interest in film. And uh, I, I think it was more a case of even in my architectural education, I was very, very much engaged in using film as part of that process, as part of my studio work, as, as um, things I was researching as well. And I think I've, I've sort of tried to keep that interest in trying to understand the relationship between the two, given that they're both sort of very experiential mediums about kind of creating space, creating narratives. Um, dealing with you know the senses, the human senses, um, and so I think you know it's it's been embedded quite early on for me. But uh, I mean, there's certainly an element in architectural practice that the nerdiness I really enjoy. Still, I still really miss you know doing kind of good plans and just uh, you know some quality AutoCAD time. Uh, but I think you know that there's there's more to it than that for me, certainly. And I, and I think for me, it is something that's both connected, but also working separately as a filmmaker with an architectural training and an architectural understanding, and also working as an architect with a filmic understanding and a, and a sort of, well, slightly improvised filmic training. Um, so I think it's more sort of symbiotic for me. Hmm. Lindsay, did you want to say a few words on that too? <laughs> Yes, I certainly can. I mean, I think for me, um, I've always, um, ever since very shortly after I graduated, been in academia. I mean, research has been my interest and my passion um, and, and using architectural tools not to solve problems, but to produce knowledge. Um, but the particular work that I'm involved with now actually began where I lived and worked for many years in Johannesburg, South Africa, and realizing that Johannesburg as a city lay on the watershed between the Indian and the Atlantic Oceans. That extraordinary image of the city that divided one, you know, north to the Indian Ocean, south to the Atlantic Ocean, started to really um, inspire an interest in the geographic of, of architecture, the geography of architecture. And I think that has really concluded in firstly work on the Indian Ocean and now work on the monsoon. Kesh, did you have something to contribute as well? Um, yeah, I suppose like throughout my education, I was always trying to tie architecture back to issues that I really cared about. So that was like race, migration, um, citizenship. I think it's, it's a lot easier in that context to bring it back to something that you care about, but it kind of gets lost when you um, go into the world of work. Um, and it's really hard to explore those themes in practice. Uh, obviously, like the Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust is doing a lot of good work to get ethnic minorities into traditional architecture practice. Um, but the actual work itself doesn't kind of give you the space to deal with those issues, right? So it kind of, I mean, for me, anyway, it makes you feel like you're going a bit crazy because no one's talking about it. Um, and you're constantly trying to find that place where you can um, express yourself, but also kind of research and get involved in these um, issues that are like deeply personal to you. Um, so I think at the moment, the only way to do that is really in architectural research, unfortunately. Gosh, it's quite a depressing thought actually, Kish, that in fact, you know, R&D research and development, which is a big part of the most innovative businesses independent of discipline across the world, is something that is so totally marginalized within the context of professional practice. Um, that it, and also, especially I think, um, within the ways in which we look mm. at conventional practice. But I wanted to pick up on just something you mentioned a moment ago, um, which really alludes to much of what many of you have presented, this kind of you know, working beyond the building. And, and actually, if you and I can continue, and then we'll go back through the other speakers. You know, something that occurred, that you just said reminded me of the kind of perennial complaint that uh, many professional practitioners level against educators and that is that students are not made ready for the reality of professional practice and my view has always been if we actually told them just how bad it is then we'd lose them prior to them actually qualifying and so that would be even worse 
in terms of retention statistics, actually, I think in many ways, um, what I see in so much of the work we've seen today is a, you know, something that in a way is why people join architecture, why people choose to study it, because they believe, as I did when I signed up, that it would be a means through which um, one could articulate a serious commitment to some form of ethical activity as a professional. And of course, that reality is challenged throughout education experience in general. And I suppose, you know, it's interesting, like thinking about the way in which your, I suppose, your ethical intentions have evolved through the crucible of education and now into professional practice. So my question really for you and, and feelers, of course, too, really concerns what, why is it important to kind of, you know, move beyond the object oriented ontology obsession with artifacts as outputs and really work beyond the building into something that potentially lacks any of the materiality with which we're accustomed. In your case, you almost went through a specification sheet where you started talking about, you know, tire burning rates, which was phenomenal. I thought, wow, I wish I'd seen one of them one of those when I was doing interior design. I think a few burning tires might have improved some of those corporate interiors. But it's interesting thinking about how so many of the processes you were talking about as being, you know, radical, forensic and and about architecture as witness really map onto um, something far more authentic and ethical about how um, buildings are configured but I think you know that's what's so interesting you talk about the building as a palimpsest as a witness and so on so I really want to get into the kind of nuts and bolts if you like of why you feel it's very important not to to start come forward with a, a building based solution in the way that you work there's always that restraint and it's much more about the analysis using the material of buildings as this imprint but why 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 do you think especially that that's um, something you found yourself being entirely committed to well, I mean, firstly, on like the on the building side of things, I don't think um, the the kind of fact of building something is necessarily like a bad or a negative thing, right? So, for example, I mean, it's in a simple answer, it's the kind of like why behind it. Um, like with forensic architecture, we've we have built. Um, so we built a one-to-one -one model of uh, a site of a murder. Um, so we could test whether a special agent who was there at the time could smell, see, or hear um, the kind of the incident that happened while he was like a few feet away. Um, so in that case, the building, the building of the of the one-to-one -one model is kind of like completely um, entangled into the politics and ethics of um, the case and of what we're trying to investigate, uncover, unravel. Um, so I would say that I think it's less about building itself, it's more about the way that we conceive of building at the moment, um, maybe like the sort of client designer relationship, the kind of how we see ourselves as service providers, we kind of need to break away from that to create social and political change. Absolutely. Um, thank you. I think that's great. And I, I, I'm very interested in the idea that there isn't this kind of wholesale abandonment of buildings after that, but there's so much, so much more of a considered approach to even um, get to uh, produce that kind of output at all. Um, and one that's not necessarily in, embedded in the work stages, shall we say. Um, yeah. Lindsay, I'd love to kind of direct that question toward you um, in relation to your work. Again, I mean, yours is even more, um, I think, much more in a way, um, working in a particular Kind of architecture as witness approach but also there's some proposition propositional dimension that is i think entirely interdisciplinary um i imagine much of what you do can surface in all kinds of um, professional context reports and policy documents so it's interesting seeing mm -hmm. the ways in which that information could be um have many different audiences which is as you know a criticism routinely leveled against architects that we talk to ourselves and not to anyone else whereas i think your work has you know, incredible power in the way that it's accessible and translates easily across context and, and, dis and different disciplines and professions. Do you want to speak a bit about your, um, if you like, your understanding and your agendas, um, and if you like, a almost manifesto um, regarding mm -hmm. building in general? Mm -hmm. Thanks, um, Harriet, for that. You know, I mean, it's it's very noticeable if you know our work that we didn't design solutions. We didn't design buildings. We didn't do urban design. We didn't try and fix the context in which we were working. And we did that very consciously um, because the countries we were working in are full of solutions provided by Dutch consultants, Asian bank development consultants and so on. Solutions are a dime a dozen, and yet those solutions are without substance, they're without any understanding of contexts. That's the one reason. So it was a, it was a re resistance of a kind of colonial um, agenda. 
The other thing we found is that architects in the countries we worked in are very well trained and very good. So who are we to actually bring solutions um, to people who understand their context far better than we do? However, what our work did was really to change the way that questions are asked. And by focusing on something that is normally just drawn as a little arrow uh, of wind or a sun on a drawing, to actually embed the questions within wider meteorological systems, we found people have found that extraordinarily useful. Um, the people that we've worked with in the countries that we that we were engaged with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you. That's great. So Chris, I don't know if that answers your question, but really it was the saying. Let's try and let's try and rechange. Okay, sorry. Okay, carry on. No, I like that. Yeah, I let's try and rechange. Just leave it there. <laughs> yeah. um, I think what so, you just pointed out is um, it's really good because I think in all your talks there was an element of taking almost like the element of architecture and reconceptualizing. So we're still with the weather, like it's not just something hanging over our heads, right? We're still with the idea of shelter. It's not just a thing that is there, we use it. And I think Chris, like you do that with the idea of the address and the building in the sense is very much part of your uh, agenda, but you reconceptualize it. So maybe you wanna add to what Harriet was asking. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, the reason I ended up doing proxy dress was because it seems such a such a waste in a sense that during education we learn so many skills, and yet the you know in education the only thing you don't do is get a building built, and then you graduate, and then your skills are put through the lens of practice, and you're expected to only really get buildings built, and it seems like there's a huge waste on the side of skills that could really help with a lot of problems that are architectural problems but because for some reason we seem to subscribe to the idea that there should be one singular output from those skills they just don't get used and to me you know we live in a time where the problems that we face are you know multidisciplinary they cross boundaries and really if we are going to stick to our own professional boundaries there's going to be a lot of problems that we can't solve and and certainly through proxy address you know the one thing that i found incredibly interesting about it is that it's it's skimmed across so many different sectors whether it be postal or financial or um, data security or identity verification all of these different things have an input into the into the, the actual project itself and having to cross between them is 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 something that is just a case of well that's where the problem is let's follow it um and i do think that from my point of view i mean so i i still practice architecture and funnily enough i mean one of the projects i'm working on is a homeless shelter in london and so for me proxy address was very much a broadening rather than a pivoting away from architecture it was simply to say well as a as a studio we do architecture but if there's a problem that doesn't require a building or a building wouldn't be the most appropriate solution we do the other thing instead and for me that that's what good design should be it should be not focusing on imposing an output it should be about interrogating something to find the most appropriate output yeah that's it's very interesting um one of the ways in which we conceptualize this um this shift in ways of practicing in the books was the need to for the architects to move upstream and get into the place where the decisions are made before it is even decided that the building is a solution to the problem that we're posed and in terms of being an active participant within discussions around sustainability, for instance, like you can't really ask the right questions until you are, un unless you are in that space, until you are much more extreme at, at, the, at the level of policy, at the level of you know, even asking what the weather is, as, as you, you guys have showed. So I just wondered like, if you had some tangible examples for, for us, for the audience of how your agency has or, or like tangible examples of how your you have gained agency in doing what you do in terms of participating to these wider discussions or even defining what 
um, sustainability is. So is that addressed to me? Well, to you, maybe you. <laughs> Mark, um, in terms of... I'll, I'll let Mark jump in. Yeah. No, 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 feel free. If you have an answer to that, maybe, like, you go on. Well, I think I think from my point of view, um, certainly the one of the big constraints of architecture for me is the fact that quite often your client, apart from maybe private residential, your client isn't the end user. Your client is a, an in-between agency between you and the end user. So often getting the interests of the end user through becomes a, a case of having to find an alibi to get the best result for somebody who isn't your client. And for me, working in proxy address, the end result well, the end user is obviously somebody who is facing homelessness, and there's a lot of stakeholders to get through in the meantime. So I wouldn't say necessarily that the, the agency is any closer as such, but I would say that the negotiation that architecture has taught me in that process has been really useful to equip me to actually get the best end result for the end user. Hmm. Interesting, thank you. I mean, I'm just gonna interject here because we've had some, we have some back of house, um, wonders um fishing from the audience for some questions i would like to obviously hear um for the from the viewers or listeners in this case as well um some of their thoughts and some of their questions so i might just uh, do an adaptation of one we received about architecture curriculum evolving to reflect architecture as climate practice so maybe i could kind of add a kind of um i don't know a subheading to this which is really about something i raised at the beginning when we we're doing introductions about the essentially the intersection of climate crisis um, and also um, social justice for us, it, certainly at Pratt, for example, this is one of our big preoccupations because the two are hard to mm. separate. So one could argue so much of the work that we've seen today has an ec ecological dimension to it, despite in many cases having a, a very strong social agenda, whether it's um, Kish's pollution as a consequence of tire burning or Lindsay, what, what Lindsay was saying relative to the monsoons. Um, you know, there's, and also, of course, the, the, the kind of physiological impact of being homeless um, and, and exposed to climatic extremes, which can be life threatening if, uh, along with everything else. So I think there's, all, there's dimensions to this because what we understand climate crisis to do or the, the climate crisis to do is discriminate actively against um, people of colour and um, certainly on global south regions. Um, and more often on gender um, too, statistically. So I think it's interesting to be asked this question, and it seems at first, of course, as if it's a segue away from what we're talking about with you, but I actually think it really isn't. And I suppose it's a question that maybe one or two of you might want to answer, but you know, is the ecological crisis necessarily driving what you're doing, or do you feel that it's something that runs in parallel? Um, kind of, if you were looking at it, perhaps alchemically, if you had the proportions of the kind of social emphasis, if you like, um, and then the climate, dimensions and Lindsay it's far too easy question for you to answer mm. I'm afraid um, I think but for the others interested in sort of thing seeing or at least understanding how you kind of think about those two as as a kind of very live and interactive dynamic in, rela in relation to what you produce yeah I'm happy to jump in I mean I think you know there's I guess the three key ways I mean one for for migration is with with increasing climate disaster you know there's only going to be more and more migration so the sheltering of um people in desperate situations uh, fleeing that and trying to rehouse themselves and move is only going to get more and more. I think in a, a second very practical dimension, you know, architecture involves making stuff. And so we all have an architect and an ecological responsibility to minimize our impact. And when we choose not to make, when we choose to make, when we and how we choose to make, if we do choose to make. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the shelter process is a key part of that. Sustainability is very much lagging in the humanitarian shelter sector for, for many understandable reasons in, in some ways, but also something that is is starting to gain more uh, prioritization for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think ultimately it's, it's, it's the, and the third way is that, you know, the, the ecological question is also ultimately a political one. And I think that's something that's easily forgotten that architecture is an incredibly political act. And that's exaggerated massively in the humanitarian shelter sector. Um, and I think that's partly why architects have not been involved. I mean, there's, there's other reasons too, for quite understandable that, you know, you can't just replicate the traditional architectural process. Uh, also, there's many examples of uh, absolutely abysmal architectural proposals for humanitarian shelter. I mean, very well-meaning competitions to very well-meaning student um, ideas, but you know, it's humanitarian shelter is incredibly complicated and that's why you know I'm not certainly I'm not I don't think my colleagues would advocate for architects to be running that process 
but rather to be a key part of that collaborative process with you know local the local people on the ground and bringing architectural expertise and that architectural way of thinking and i totally agree with what lindsay and chris are saying and kish that it's it's that breadth of thinking the training we get as architects and importantly the the professional uh, process of getting licensed as well added on that in the experience of strategic compromise integrated thinking uh, dealing with complex political social cultural dynamics which is really vital um, in all mm. forms of shelter particularly its most vital and essential form of humanitarian shelter absolutely well said um, I actually want to just break with convention and ask, um, actually, we've just got another question, so I might just jump back to that. I was going to, but I might actually know, don't do that. I would like to invite any of the actual speakers to ask a question of each other. I get a bit tired when it's like chairs following the formula of asking speakers, which is our, our job is easy, yours is really challenging. So I think you may have questions for each other. I mean, it's interesting seeing, looking at the work, looking at all of you through this particular lens of the book. Um, in this case, um, you know, ir ir irrelevant to your relationship with this, if you like, rendering of, of what is a, a quite a number of people operating in this way. Um, but I just wonder if there's anything that you would like to ask of each other, because I think there's been some provocations here, because, you know, it not, in not just in relation to things that you're doing that align, but some of the differences in your approaches too. Hmm. And if this experiment's about to fail, no problem, because we have a question from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, we'll go to that. Oh, just experiment. So, um, okay, this one is a um, very lovely one. Do you think the issue of architects moving beyond buildings as their primary mode of practice is tied to their belief in buildings as the most secure form of monetary compensation? So, economist hats on, who would like to answer this one relative to what they do? Go for it, Lindsay. I mean, if I could just come in there, I mean, I think that's an extraordinarily good question because how does one fund this kind of work that we're all doing? Some people fund it from their own practice, but for the most part, I mean, my work, I think the work of forensic architecture, I might be wrong, um, but grants, by research grants. So, you know, there's another whole set of skills one has to learn to as to how to source funding for the kind of work that we're doing, because the mainstream funding still goes to building buildings, as, as the question suggests. Um, so I think, you know, that re research grant um, applications become qu quite a key part of education if one's going to shift what one does. Yeah, I'd agree yeah, with I that. Just, and it's interesting. Really, Sorry. Jumping. I was going to say, I totally agree. I mean, we couldn't have done the project we did and, and done the, the, any of the work we could without research funding. And it was through sort of a fortunate situation of being able to argue that it was a, a form of research um, and it was architectural. Um, but I think that's a huge challenge. And it's a huge challenge for architects mm -hmm. coming out of school to to use their skills in very architectural ways which aren't about buildings and a lot of people have amazing set of skills that could be transforming our world in many ways without buildings but there's just not the kind of outlet for that or the financial support for that that is a huge challenge i i, I completely mm -hmm. agree and it's interesting isn't it, seeing the shift because mm -hmm. we've often talked about this are those of us who are old enough um, the way that prior to um, sort of uh, you know 80s consumerism and corporatism in the UK, many architects worked for local governments um, um, in local planning mm. offices doing you know the big kind of social project, which was um, post Second World War meritocratic, state-driven uh, social housing, healthcare, and education. And of course, as that crumbled under you know if you like a swing to the right under Margaret Thatcher, of course, then our architects were suddenly decoupled from their in many ways, ethical context and an employer and then left to fend for themselves. And in this particular dynamic, many of them, you know, the arguments were always, of course, that the only work we can do is unethical work. It's all what the client dictates. And I think coming back to your earlier point about how profoundly political architecture is, I think that, you know, com complicity is, um, you know, is entirely um, should be held accountable in the same way. Um, just well, equally accountable to people who um, who actually try, who um, deliberately choose those kinds of projects. Uh, I think that's certainly something that's been resonating in the US when we saw Trump's border wall manifest or at least attempt to manifest. And, and of course, we had the AIA get behind Trump, um, which is why it had a sudden mass exodus of all its members. Um, so architecture indeed is political. 
So I think um, I'm just aware of time. We've got four more minutes. Um, is uh, Roberta, would you like to ask another question or should we go to the other one in the I would chat just add there? something to that question maybe before uh, we go sure. to the other one, which is, I don't know if like buildings are such a secure form of monetary compensation as in like, yeah, maybe now, but if we're thinking, if you're trying to project beyond the immediate present, let's say, and think about the future of architecture in the context of climate change or humanitarian crisis, et cetera, we might be talking about a future in which making buildings is simply just not viable. So even like the security mm -hmm. or like, or maybe there's gonna be AI making buildings for you. So I don't think there is, security attached to in, in terms of like monetary compensation there's no security attached to buildings and i think this effort to decouple the architect's job from making buildings is also a way of future people in the profession against that massive change which is inevitable i think hmm. yeah. agreed and what qualifies as compensation is up for negotiation. We've seen the rise of Bitcoin, other trading systems, um, and I think that's where it starts to get interesting. Um, but I am aware of time. We have three more minutes, right? So maybe we should hop to the last question. Oh, welcome back, Chris. Oh, this is back. Yeah, nice <laughs> so to, to that, well um, So we're just actually, Chris, just bouncing to one of the questions in the chat, which was posted at 118, just FYI for reference want to find it which just really concerns i suppose it's one directed really to roberta and i but potentially some of you too um and it's in when we produce the book i mean of course as soon as we sent the entire manuscript off to print the immediate request to be in it from people from all over the world including you know um the first female naval officer of ghana who apparently is a female or whatever so it was very interesting kind of um cataloging whether it's you know ice cube or samuel l jackson or gord matter clark and those that were alive anyway, we reached out to many of them on Twitter in a desperate attempt to see their participation in the first edition. But maybe we, now we've got a book under our belt, we could mount a more concerted assault. Quite like the idea of interviewing Ice Cube. I don't know if you've seen his fantastic film about um, the Eames House in LA. But I think, you know, the question here really concerns, are it, how do we see this book evolving? Well, frankly, if it in some ways can do something, I think, to loosen the grip of an architectural title on people who only produce buildings, then that would be a good start. I think that we are hemorrhaging our talent to these nondescript or non-architectural assignations, um, and then doing so diminish uh, the scale of our influence across all sectors um, and all contexts. I think that would be a good place to start, and maybe this book is part of that process. I also think that, um, this book in the hands of others um, as it evolves. I'm interested in where it might travel, how will practice adapt when predominantly we're still teaching students to design buildings from scratch when most of the architectural work within the next five years is going to be um, adaptive reuse. We have enormous slight supply chain issues already because of the pandemic. We also know that 7% of the world's workforce is indentured or slave labor within the construction industry. In fact, the construction industry is one of the biggest employers of contemporary slave labor um, and that's quite a phenomenon not to mention you know beyond the human factors is, is of course ecological implications of extracting mm. materials shipping them across the planet in order to make the thirty thousand new things a year that we all create that nobody actually really needs ostensibly so i think there are some you know ongoing ethical issues that this book will continue to be battered around by or iterations of this book and versions of this book but i think you know one of the things that's uh, for me at least interesting is understanding how the timing of it i hope encourage so many students to not feel bereft of having chosen architecture within a pandemic knowing that the arch, you know the architecture generally is the, the canary in the mine of economic decline because it's the first to suffer enormous losses in terms of jobs and by implication employment but to see the skill sets that they have having transposability and tactility and also in many ways i think this resilience um, that can point them towards other forms of activity that in some ways are probably the reasons they joined architecture to begin with so um, that would be my take on it. Roberta, what's yours? No, I think I subscribe to everything you've said and um, perhaps we should bring these to a close. And right. if you can bring on the last slide, I will, I'd like to- You can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to just thank all the speakers and the audience for joining us and to thanks to Chloe and the RIBA for organizing this talk and just remind the audience that this talk is part of um, a serious architecture renew 
And that next month's talk in July will focus on rewilding, so stay tuned for that one. Um, and then the last thing is the RIBA Bookshop has kindly created an exclusive offer for tonight's ticket holders. So you can get Architects After Architecture at a discounted price. And uh, with that, I'll just want to thank you again and maybe just remind you of the networking function that you can now use. So thanks again, everyone, and lovely to see you all.